Hi, my name is Amanda Thomas. If you're following me here from TikTok, thank you so much. I am so sorry that it took me two weeks to come out with a new YouTube video, but this is crazy. I have no clue what I'm doing. I recorded the entire thing and lost all of the footage, and I do have a full-time job, so I was not able to re-record until today. This is Saturday uh, on the weekend, so... <laughs> Bear with me while I try to figure out the logistics that is YouTube. I don't know what I'm doing, but we will get through it. We will muddle through and I will figure it out. So I'm really sorry about that. But today I decided we were going to cover a case that happened near my hometown in Kansas. And it's a really well-known case, the BTK case. But I remember very vividly when BTK came back out into the public. It was a very scary time for all of Kansas, I think, and probably a lot of the world. It was a very, very scary time. In fact, I have a story of going camping with a few of my friends during this time. And in order to scare me, they told me that BTK was going to get me. And I did not sleep that night. So, yeah, that was fun. But just a trigger warning, today is a pretty heavy conversation, like most of my videos will be. We will be discussing things like murder and essay. So if those things bother you, please just go ahead and click off this video. Your mental health is so much more important than anything else. So let's get started. On January 15th of 1974, the Otero family was at home getting ready for the day. The three older children had already made their way to school, and that left Joseph Sr., who was 38, his wife Julie, who was 35, and their two youngest children, Josephine, who was 11, and Joseph Jr., who was 9 years old. BTK was waiting outside, waiting to make entrance into the home. He had already cut the phone lines to the house, so there was no way for the family to call out or receive any calls. When BTK was able to make his way into the home, he held the family at gunpoint. He told them he was a convict on the run, just in need of food, money, and a car, and he would be on his way. He then forced the family into a bedroom where he tied them all up. He started his attack with Julie. He strangled her until he thought she was dead, and then he moved on to Joseph and Joseph Jr., he murdered them both in the same way, starting with Joseph Sr. He tied a bag over their heads and slowly suffocated them to death. Josephine seemed to be the target of his attack, and he took her down into the basement where there was a pipe that he could hang her from. In later confessions, BTK would admit to fulfilling his sexual fantasies while he was with Josephine. He left his semen at the crime scene. The family would be found by the older three Otero children. When they came into the home, they saw that breakfast was still on the table and their mother's purse was scattered on the kitchen counter. This was extremely unusual for her as Julie liked to keep a very tidy home. They also said that they could feel the death in the air. They knew that something was wrong and when they discovered their family, they ran to a neighbor's house where they were able to call for help. There were virtually no leads in this case and it did not take long for it to go cold. It was only a few months later that BTK found his next target, and that target would be Catherine Bright. On April 4th of 1974, BTK snuck into her house and hid in her bedroom. Around 2 p.m., Catherine came home with her brother, Kevin, and it seems like BTK was not expecting her brother, Kevin, to be there. So when he rushed them, he seemed a little bit frazzled, like he didn't know what to do. He forced them into a bedroom where he had Kevin tie up Catherine. BTK was then unsuccessful at tying up Kevin, and there was a struggle. They struggled for the gun, and Kevin was almost successful in gaining control of the situation, but BTK ultimately won. That's when he shot Kevin in the head. He then refocused on Catherine and went into her bedroom where he began strangling her. But Catherine was fighting back and BTK thought that this was too much work, so he began stabbing her in the abdomen. BTK was not aware that Kevin had survived the gunshot wound to the head. Kevin ran outside where he saw two men. He told them what was going on and one of those men drove him to the hospital while the other one called for help. BTK became aware that Kevin had escaped and he got scared and ran off. He was able to make a full escape. Emergency rescue was able to come in while Catherine was still alive, but after multiple surgeries and blood transfusions, Catherine did pass away. Kevin did not realize that she was dead until several days after the attack. Kevin did survive. He made an almost full recovery, but he does have some lasting effects of this attack. 
The Otero murders and Catherine's Bright murder would take years to be tied together. The MO was so different that they didn't think that they could possibly be the same suspect, but it was in a later confession where BTK confessed to killing both Catherine Bright and the Otero families that they were able to make the connection. It would take three years for BTK to find his next project, as he liked to call them. He met a woman at a bar named Cheryl, and he decided that she would be the next target. When he went to go to Cheryl's house, he realized that she wasn't home, so he began walking around her neighborhood. It was then that he saw a little boy who was walking home from the grocery store for his mother. He approached the little boy and told him that he was a private investigator and showed him a picture. Most people believe that it was a picture of BTK's own family and asked him if he recognized anyone. The boy said no and continued on his way. BTK watched to see what house he would go into and then assumed correctly that his mother would be there. And one of Shirley's sons, Steve, decided, opened the door and invited BTK into the house. BTK had again told him that he was a private investigator. Once BTK had gone into the house, he turned off the TV and turned down the blinds. When Shirley realized that something was going on in her house, she came into the living room. And again, BTK held them at gunpoint. He forced Cheryl's three children into the bathroom and shut the door behind him. He then barricaded the door so that they could not get out. Shirley was obviously very scared, so he tried. BTK tried to calm her nerves and had a cigarette and gave her a glass of water. He told her that he was going to have his way with her, but somehow convinced her it was not going to be S.A. While the kids were screaming in the bathroom, BTK tied Shirley to her bed. He then strangled her by putting a cord around her neck. He again left his semen on her nightgown next to her bed. He had planned on killing the children that day too, but he was scared off when the phone rang. So the children did survive the attack. It was later that same year that BTK became obsessed with a woman named Nancy Fox. Nancy lived by herself and she worked several jobs to be able to afford living by herself, so BTK really had no problem breaking into her home and hiding in her kitchen until she he was able to surprise her when she returned home. Once again at gunpoint, he forced Nancy into her own bedroom. It was there that he told her he had a sexual problem and he would have to SA her in order to get rid of that problem. He partially undressed her before tying her to the bed. He then also undressed himself and then began strangling her. While he was strangling her, he told her who he was and what he had done. Her body was found thanks to a tip that BTK himself left. He called the police department and said that they would find a homicide at Nancy's address. Police did find it strange the way he said homicide instead of homicide. Police decided to release that recording in hopes that somebody would recognize the voice or recognize the way he used his language and possibly put in a tip that would lead to his arrest. While they did get many tips, nothing was solid enough to make an arrest. And again, they were able to find BTK's DNA at the scene of Nancy Fox's murder. On April 28th of 1979, BTK would break into another woman's home. He was waiting for her to arrive home when he had to leave. He was not able to enact what he had wanted to do. But this would not stop him from terrorizing this woman. He sent her a letter that contained several things that he had stolen from the home. And also a, there was a poem inside that said something along the lines of, why weren't you home? This was terrifying to the woman as it would have been for me as well, and she packed up and left. Police had decided that it was probably her daughter that BTK was targeting at the time, but either way, she left the area and she did remain safe. BTK went silent for seven years after this. But on April 27th of 1985, Maureen Hedges would become his next victim. Maureen was a widow and she was living by herself. BTK once again cut her phone lines while she wasn't home and went and waited in her closet in her bedroom. But when Maureen came home, she was with a male friend. And maybe BTK had learned from previous attempts at this that this wasn't his best bet to attack her while she was with somebody else. So he waited in her closet until she went to bed. Around 1 a.m., he flipped on the bathroom light and attacked her while Maureen was in her bed. He again strangled Maureen, but this time he went away from his MO and he took Maureen and put her into the trunk of her own car. 
Marine's body was found about a week after her murder on a dirt road outside of Park City, which is about 13 minutes away from Wichita. Vicki Weggerly would become BTK's next victim. He was walking down the street when he heard Vicki playing the piano, and that's what originally attracted him to her. On September 16th of 1986, BTK dressed as a telephone repairman. He then cut the phone lines to the Weggerly home and then knocked on the door. He introduced himself as a telephone repairman, and Vicki let him in. He then, at gunpoint, told Vicki that he was going to tie her up. That is when he strangled her. This time he spent a little bit more time with her and he positioned her into different poses and took pictures of her. He then took Vicky's car and left the scene. It was during this time that Vicky's husband Bill was coming home for lunch and he noticed his car traveling in the opposite direction, but he wasn't able to recognize the driver. When he arrived home, it took him a little bit to find Vicky. He did find his younger son unattended, and when he did find Vicky, he immediately called for emergency services, and they were able to make it while Vicky was still alive. But she would be pronounced dead of, at the hospital a short time later. Initially, investigators believed that Bill might have been who killed Vicky, and Bill would live under this cloud of suspicion until BTK confessed to her murder. Bill did fail two different polygraph tests, and it just kind of goes to show how unreliable polygraph tests are. But the person administering the test said that Bill probably failed these tests because of extreme stress. BTK waited another four years to attack his next victim. His last victim would be Dolores Davis. She was 62 years old and she was living on her own. He waited until he knew that Dolores was asleep and then took a cinder block that he found in her backyard and threw it through her back doors. Dolores was obviously alarmed and she came into the living room to see what was going on and that's when she was confronted by BTK. He once again told her that he was a convict on the run and he was just in search of food, money, and a car, but then he tied her up and strangled her. But again, instead of leaving her at the scene, he put her into the trunk of her own car and drove her to a different location. He hid her and some of the evidence under a bridge near Wichita. It would take 13 days for Dolores' body to be found. It wouldn't be until 2005 that BTK was given a real name, and his name was Dennis Rader. Dennis was born in Pittsburgh, Kansas on March 9th of 1945. He was the, the oldest son to William and Dorothea Rader. Dennis had a pretty unremarkable childhood. Nothing severe happened in his lifetime. He wasn't a victim of abuse or anything like that. His parents were maybe a little bit distant. His mother preferred to watch TV or read a book because compared to spending time with her children. He attended elementary school and high school and has seemed to have a pretty typical upbringing. And he participated in everything. He was involved in sports, but he wasn't really fantastic in anything that he did. In later inter interviews, Dennis would give a couple of disturbing details, like he enjoyed watching his grandmother kill chickens. It was the killing of the chickens that excited him. And there was also another memory that he shared of his mother getting stuck in a couch, I believe, and she called for him to come help. And he remembers standing there for a while being excited that she was in need of help. And it was the idea of a woman being trapped that was exciting to him. All of his classmates remember him fitting in. He wasn't really a ca like a cast out or bullied in any capacity, but maybe looking back, they did see some things that were strange. A lot of the boys in his class would go hunting together. And while the other kids in his class would have a more humane way of killing these animals in hunting, he preferred to hang them. And this is obviously a sign of a serial killer as we've you know, heard so many times before. Around the age of 11, Dennis would be hum humiliated by a teacher in front of the entire class. And Dennis decided to get revenge by going to this teacher's house later that evening and look watching her through her windows. He had brought a rope with him and he tied it around his waist as tight as he could bear. And he pleasured himself while watching her through her windows. This was a strange memory he had. He also said that he had many violent dreams growing up and that he knew what he was going to be from a very early age. After high school in 1965, Dennis enrolled in college. He went to college in Salina at the Kansas Wesleyan College. 
During his time there, he began breaking into people's homes and stealing women's underwear, but he was never caught for any of these crimes. Dennis was a very mediocre student. Uh, many teachers believe that he struggled with a learning disability of some kind. So Dennis joined the Air Force in 1966. He was stationed in Okinawa, Korea, Greece, and Turkey, and it, it was during this time where he began experimenting with different sex workers. But many of those women became very afraid of him because they were not interested in the violent sex that he liked to have. Dennis was honorably discharged from the Air Force in 1970, and he came back to Wichita where he met his wife. They married on May 22nd of 1971, and they settled in Park City. And this is when Dennis decided to go back to school, and this time he went to Butler Community College in El Dorado. It was there that he earned an associate's degree in electronics, but then he decided to go to Wichita University to get his bachelor's in administration of justice. Over the years, Dennis and his wife made a beautiful life or ever what everyone thought was a beautiful life. They had two children together and they attended church regularly and Dennis would even become the president of a church later in, you know, as it'll become important later. His wife nor his children knew what kind of a monster they were living with. In fact, this would become, this would come as a total shock to his whole family. Dennis had several different jobs during his lifetime. When he first got married, he worked for a small aircraft manufacturing company, but an oil crisis in 1973 would shut that company down. While he was unemployed, Dennis was able to really get into his dark fantasies. He just had a lot of time on his hands to really look into these dark things he was he enjoyed. He would get police magazines that often had pictures of bondage and bodies and those kinds of things, very horrible things, and this just fed his violent fantasies even further. Most of the time that he was active as a serial killer, BTK worked for a security company, a well-known security company. I don't want to get in trouble for saying it, even though it's out there. And there's obviously no way that this security company would know that he was a serial killer and that he was a predator, but it is scary to me that the person that was coming in to install these things that you know people were probably having installed because there was a serial killer on the loose, it's kind of alarming to me that he was the one coming into homes and installing them. He worked for this security company from 1974 until 1988, but it was later on that he would become a compliance officer for the town of Park City. His assistant was absolutely terrified of him. She said he was an awful boss and just extremely rude and mean. And there are some stories that came out later that said that he really seemed to like this little bit of power that he had. In fact, during his confession, BTK admitted that his assistant would have been his next victim. But Dennis was what appeared to be the perfect family man. He was a Boy Scout troop leader. He was the president of his church. He, was, he seemed to have everything just really put together. Several of his murders would be committed while he was on a Boy Scout troop, a Boy Scout camping trip. The murder of Marine Hedges was committed on one of these trips. He made the excuse that he had a headache and he needed to run into town to get some medicine for this. It was then that he went into a bowling alley and ordered a beer. He swished the beer around in his mouth and spilled some on his shirt so that he would smell like alcohol. He then pretended to be drunk and called for a taxi. He had the taxi take him to close to Maureen's house. What's scary about the murder of Maureen Hedges is that BTK was her neighbor for over 20 years. BTK took Maureen to his church to take pictures of her in the basement of this church. He was a trusted member of the church and he was given a key. He took Maureen down into the basement where he took pictures of her in different poses before dumping her body. And Dennis's daughter was actually terrified of the fact that BTK had hit so close to home. And she remembers very vividly Dennis telling her, or her father telling her that BTK was not going to hurt her. And that's chilling, you know, thinking about that later. BTK would also carry around a kill kit with him. He took this to all of his murders. He had the things that he needed to perform these gruesome acts. And a lot of times he would leave these in places like his parents' garage while he was going out and committing these acts. Or for Dolores Davis, he left the kill kit at his parents' home and he drove to his parents' home before going to Dolores' house on foot. 
And Dennis was also no stranger to communicating with the media. And honestly, this is probably one of the most fascinating parts of this case is just how open he was with the media. And it started really early on. The very first letter found by BTK was found in the Wichita Public Library in an engineering book in the basement. There were three men who had taken responsibility for the Otero family murders, and this seemed to really upset him that someone was taking credit for his work. And so he decided to write a letter to the Wichita Eagle. I am going to read some of these letters. Not all of them. Um, not all of them are available to the public because they are pretty gruesome. But um, here's a part of one of the letters. I write this letter to you for the sake of the taxpayer as well as your time. Those three dudes you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero murders. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself with no one's help. There has been no talk either. Let's put this straight. He then goes into some details about the Otero murders that only the murderer would know. I'm sorry this happened to society. They are the ones who suffer the most. It's hard to control myself. You probably call me psychotic with sexual perversion hang up. When this monster enter my brain, I will never know, but it here to stay. How does one cure himself? If you ask for help that you have killed four people, they will laugh or hit the panic button and call the cops. I can't stop it so the monster goes on and hurt me as well as society. Society can be thankful that there are ways for people like me to relieve myself at time by daydreams of some victims being tortured and being mine. It a big complicated game my friend of the my friend of the monster play putting victims number down, follow them, check up on them, waiting in the dark, waiting, waiting. The pressure is great and sometimes he run the game to his liking. Maybe you can stop him. I can't. He has already chosen his next victim or victims. I don't know who they are yet. The next day after reading the paper, I will know, but it's too late. Good luck hunting. Yours truly guilty. P.S. Since criminals do not change their M.O. or by nature cannot do so, I will not change mine. Those code words for you will be bind them, torture them, kill them. BTK. You see, he added again they will be on the next victim. The next letter came from a child letter stamping kit and it was written about Shirley Vianne. It arrived to the Wichita Eagle on January 31st of 1978 and it started out saying, Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, wilt thou be mine? And it was an obvious reference to Shirley Vianne. The thing is, is that news outlets were not publishing the BTK story or talking about the communication he was having with the media and this really seemed to upset him. So on February 10th of 1978, he sent another letter and I will read one of the excerpts from that again. How many people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? I am compelled to kill by Factor X, the same factor that motivated Son of Sam in New York, Jack the Ripper in London, and the Hillside Strangler in Los Angeles. It seems helpless, but we cannot help it. There is no help or cure except death or being caught and put away. A little article in the newspaper would have been enough. After a thing like Fox, I can go home and go about my life like anyone else. It was in this letter that he claimed to have killed Nancy Fox, the Otero family, and Shirley Vianne, and another unknown victim. Police had made the decision to not share the communications they were having with BTK with the media, thinking that this would keep the public safer, but it turned out to be the exact opposite, and this was really, this seemed to really make BTK, BTK angry. There were more letters sent about different victims, like Nancy Fox. There was a poem written about her named, or that was named, O oh Death to Nancy, and it seemed like Nancy was BTK's perfect kill. This was the one that he was the most proud of. And I'll go ahead and read the poem, O oh Death to Nancy. It says, O oh Death to Nancy, what is it that I can see, cold icy hands taking hold of me? From, for death has come, you all can see, hell has opened his gate to trick me. Oh, death, oh, death, can't you spare me over for another year? I'll stuff your jaws till you can't talk. I'll bind your legs till you can't walk. I'll tie your hands till you can't make a stand. And finally, I'll close your eyes so you can't see. I'll bring sexual death onto you for me. There was no communication from Dennis's last murder in 1991 until 2004. It was in 2004 that the Otero family murder was coming to its 30 year anniversary and it was still not solved. Many people were speculating that BTK had gone into hiding, had died, or was in prison for a different crime. There was also a book coming out about the BTK murders. 
This really seemed to make Dennis mad. He was angry that somebody else was telling his story. It was two months after the article was published that the Wichita Eagle would get a letter and it was postmarked exactly 27 years after the murder of Shirley Vianne. The Wichita Eagle received a package that included some of Vicki Weggerly's items, like her driver's license and pictures of her. And the return address was labeled as Bill Thomas Kilman. These letters would throw the Wichita area and all of Kansas really into an absolute panic. On May 5th of 2004, Dennis sent another package, but this time it was to Cake TV. This had a word puzzle in it that had clues to who BTK actually was. It also had different identification cards, one to Southwestern Bell and one to a school. On December 14th of 2004, a man in a park found another box that was from BTK. This had Nancy Fox's driver's license in it and a couple of other things like a chapter book that BTK seemed to be writing about himself. It was an autobiography of himself. And the 13th chapter was labeled, Will There Be More? So deciding to play to Dennis's ego, the police department had a media briefing where he said that the BT case, BTK case was the most difficult one that he had ever worked on. And he also said that BTK would probably be a very interesting person to talk to. There were several more communications left by Dennis, but the very last package left by Dennis was the most important one. Dennis left a package in the back of somebody's pickup and it had um, a couple notes in it and, and it was marked up with like serial killer and bomb and those types of things. Inside it gave more information into some of the victims that he had, but there was a very important question on it. In it, he had written on a piece of paper asking if he left a floppy disk, would that be, would police be able to tie that back to him? He also asked police to give him um, the answer by taking out an ad in the newspaper. So police did just that. They took out an ad that said, it'll be okay, Rex. And then they waited. Cake TV soon got a postcard in the mail saying that a floppy disk would arrive soon. And that floppy disk did arrive soon. A quick analysis of it would lead to a church in Wichita. The last user of the disc was a man named Dennis. After a quick Google search, they were able to find that Dennis Rader was the president of the church that they were looking at. The surveillance video showed Dennis dropping off the package in the back of somebody's pickup truck, and they, he was seen driving a darker colored SUV. They weren't wanting to jump the gun in case they would scare him away or that it wasn't BTK and they'd scare away the real BTK. So they drove past Dennis Rader's house and noticed that he was driving a very dark colored Jeep Cherokee, which is an SUV. They also had all of this DNA from all of these crime scenes available to them. So they went to Dennis's, Dennis's daughter's uh, doctor at the university that she had gone to, and she had several pap smears on file. They took the DNA from the, her pap smears, then they found that she was the daughter of BTK. It was on February 25th of 2005 that police surrounded BTK while he was driving home from work and arrested him. Dennis was interrogated for 30 hours, and at first he didn't say anything, but eventually he just started spilling everything. He started talking about everything like he was proud of what he had done. And what's really interesting is that he seemed shocked that police had lied to him about the floppy disk. He, it seemed like he thought the police had enjoyed the game as much as he did. After searching Dennis's home, they found trophies that he had taken from each of his victims, and they were able to convict him. Friends and family were devastated by this and they never saw this coming. They thought that Dennis was a very good family man and that this was not ever something that he was capable of. His wife was granted an emergency divorce and she left town as she should have and I hope she has a very peaceful life after this. She was a victim in this as well. The court case started on July 27th of 2005 and he pled guilty to 10 counts of murder. He then confessed to all of his crimes and uh, went into great detail about what he had done. And you can actually watch this on YouTube. It's where I found it, but it's not for the faint of heart and I wouldn't uh, recommend it by any means. Victims were able to give victim statements and then Dennis was able to give a statement as well. And it's very obvious that he does not show any remorse for any of the things that he did. 
On August 8th of 2005, Dennis Rader was sentenced to life in prison. He is not eligible for parole until 2180. He was not given the death sentence as uh, the death sentence was not uh, legal in Kansas during the time that he had committed the crimes. So I think the big question is what drove BTK to kill? There wasn't anything significant in his life that really led to him being a murderer. He seemed to have a pretty typical childhood free of abuse and free of any, you know, major traumas or anything like that. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose anyone. I don't, you know, know these things except for what I research and what I, I see other professionals talking about. But it seems that he was a sexual sadist. He would often loosen the ties while he was strangling somebody just to retighten them. He never essayed any of his victims. He never, uh, it seemed he got satisfaction from the actual kill itself. He was extremely controlling and he craved to have control over his victims. The thing that made Dennis different than a lot of serial killers is he had an extremely long cooling off period. And it seems that during these cooling off periods, a lot of times he would tie himself up and take pictures of himself in very strange poses. And maybe this is how he was able to have such long cooling off periods. Dennis did have a family and it seems like maybe that stopped him from being able to fulfill his sexual fantasies as regularly as he would have wanted to. Like I said, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a professional, but after doing my research, it seems that a lot of people think that he had, on top of being a sexual sadist, he also had narcissistic personality disorder and psycho psychopathy. And it seems he was a natural born killer. It was just in his DNA from the time that he was born. Now he tries to shrug off responsibility for it, saying that it was Factor X that led him to do all of these things. He says that Factor X is who is responsible for these murders and not him self. And the only regret that he ever shows is the fact that he got caught. But Dennis is now at the El Dorado Correctional Facility where he is spending his life sentence. According to the news, he has suffered a stroke and he also has dementia. And so I wonder if he even remembers the crimes he committed. His daughter came out with a tell-all book and um, I haven't read it yet, but I, I would like to. But what are your thoughts on this? This is a very heavy case and it's extremely, it's exhausting, honestly, to go through it. And I remember the fear that went through all of Kansas when he came out of hiding. I was around 12, uh, I was anywhere from 10 to 13 or 14 when this happened. And I can't, I can remember just the fear that everyone felt during that time when he came back out of hiding. But it's an interesting case and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So if you want to share them down in the comments, um, I'll be down there as well having a conversation. But thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate having you here. I hope you find peace and comfort in your everyday life and I'll see you next time. Bye.